would like to uh, welcome everyone out tonight to uh, uh, the first uh, session of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society meeting. I'm uh, Doug Anderson and I'm on the board and I've been asked to um, introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, first of all, I, I consider it a, an honor to be at this meeting. I have been a past president and uh, have really enjoyed getting to, to know a little bit more about the society and, and uh, the great history that we have here in Ogden and some of the many great speakers that we've had come and present to our physicians in our community here. So again, I think we have another great year planned uh, as far as meetings and topics. Uh, you know, one of my favorite parts of the, of the uh, meetings is sort of what's new in, in your specialty. And I think tonight we're having a little bit of that. And so I'm really looking forward to, to tonight's presentations. Um, we, first of all, though, I need to uh, uh, thank our sponsors, uh, especially the Ogden Clinic for uh, hosting this event tonight and for their uh, uh, kind uh, consideration in, in uh, helping this uh, become a reality. And also some of the other sponsors that are, are contributing too as far as the National Kidney Foundation and the um, Family Practice uh, 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 Residency, too. Um, at this time, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Paul Schofield, who will be presenting our uh, first speaker. Paul is the CEO of the Ogden Clinic and has been with the Ogden Clinic for the last nine years. And during that time, the Ogden Clinic has experienced a significant amount of success, uh, both in growth and uh, increasing the uh, number of physicians and, and mid-levels who uh, practice at the Ogden Clinic. And so we're grateful for all that he's done for the Ogden Clinic and for our medical community, really. And so with that, we'll, we'll, we'll turn some time over to Paul Schofield to introduce our first speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, it is a pleasure for us, the Ogden Clinic, to be here and be a sponsor of the uh, Ogden Surgical Medical Society. We have had an active involvement in this uh, organization over the past several years. In fact, uh, a for one of the former chairs of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society is, is here with us, and I'd like to acknowledge him tonight, uh, Dr. Robert Whipple. If you could stand up, please, and be acknowledged. <clears throat> um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Nadim Bakazi. Uh, Dr. Bakazi uh, is not only the, the president of the board of the Ogden Clinic currently, and has been for the last uh, several years, uh, but he is um, a well-respected otolaryngologist here in, uh, in the Weber County, actually northern Utah area. Uh, he has been, uh, uh, he was trained in, in the UC system, uh, starting at uh, uh, UC uh, San Diego, where he received his doctor of medicine degree, and then did his uh, residency in otolaryngology at uh, UC San Francisco. He has, uh, uh, he has a strong interest in research that continues to this day, and uh, he has a strong commitment, as you might expect, to his patients and to the community at large. Uh, he, uh, he has interests uh, including sinus surgery, obviously, um, uh, and snoring and etology. Uh, he uh, has been with the Ogden Clinic uh, since, the, since 2000, and, uh, and he has been active in, uh, in the governance of the Ogden Clinic over the period of time that he's been with us here at the Ogden Clinic and in the medical community. Uh, he's a native of California, and uh, he is, uh, uh, has a family, uh, his wife, Karen. And Karen, I think Karen is here tonight. Karen, could you stand and be acknowledged as well? Give me a hand. Thank you, Karen, for being here tonight. And Karen and Dr. Bakazi have uh, uh, proud parents of three children, uh, two daughters and one son, uh, Lauren, Olivia, and their son, Noah. Uh, Dr. Bakazi enjoys scuba diving, he enjoys baseball, he enjoys racquetball, but his true love, uh, in addition to his wife and family, is fly fishing. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nadine Bukazi. Thank you. I was told to stay away from that mic because of the feedback, so I'm going to be kind to everybody. I consider it a great honor and a great privilege to be at this society meeting. Uh, the rich history in Ogden, the tremendous history of the surgeons, that have put this together, um, Dr. Dumke, uh, Fister, and Rich, that put this wonderful symposium, has, it's just an accolade to be here, and I thank you guys for attending tonight. Uh, give you a little bit of background about myself. I uh, did train at UCSF in otolaryngology, and one of the highlights, I think, of training in a university setting are the attendings you run into. And some of my mentors believe very strongly in clinical research. 
They believe that when you expose patients to clinical research, you give them opportunities to access technology that they wouldn't otherwise get a hold of. And you're going to see some information we're going to present today and some things that I've been lucky to be participatory with, with multi-center trials regarding a new technique for chronic sinusitis called balloon sinuplasty. You know, when I was asked to describe what is new in my specialty, my mind went away right away to the field of rhinology. The world of the nose, which used to be a black box in the world of ENT, is really being very well defined. When you look at the great science being done for looking at bacterial resistance patterns, bacterial biofilms, reconstituting the normal microflora in the sinuses after eradication with antibiotics, that is going to be the next field in the next 20 years that's going to have a lot of information. So I thought of that field, but it's really burgeoning right now. There's not a lot of results, whereas this field of balloon sinuplasty in the last 10 years has come a long way, and we're going to present some outcomes data. I want to start off my lecture by dedicating this lecture to a dear friend of mine who passed away this last December, Dr. Namir Kader. Dr. Kader was a giant in this community for patient care. Um, it's just now surface, surfacing what a wonderful provider he was. He would take time out of his schedule to go up to the monastery so the monks did not have to come down for medical care. When hospice centers were having trouble finding directors, Dr. Cater was the first one to take extra shifts and make sure that they had director shifts. Um, in fact, his story is incredible. He uh, received his medical training in Iraq, and he told me, recounted the story that under Saddam Hussein, his first day in the medical clinic, a military advisor told him he would be cutting off the ear of a dissenter of Saddam Hussein's in the clinic. That was his job. Namir Kader went in the back room, asked for some time to scrub, and walked right out of the clinic and walked right out of his country, leaving his family behind. He went through refugee camps, uh, underwent an incredible medical education, and redoing it. Imagine after all the years we've spent obtaining our medical degrees to have to go to another country, relearn a language, and redo it and to have no bitterness and to take excellent care of people, he really embodies the spirit of the society and excellence in patient care. So I'd like to dedicate this to Dr. Cater. So I think to first understand what question we address with balloon sinuplasty, we have to understand what the problem is. The problem are the staggering numbers of infections that occur with sinusitis every year in the United States. 37 million cases accounting for $8.6 billion in healthcare costs. This is time missed from work, these are uh, doctor's visits, pharmaceutical costs. 58 million days of restricted activity to patients with sinusitis. And I did not know this, but a staggering one in five antibiotic prescriptions are due to chronic sinusitis or acute sinusitis. What does this do? This trem places tremendous pressure on us as clinicians to diagnose sinusitis well and to treat it appropriately. And in the world of otolaryngology, we conduct over 525,000 sinus surgeries every year. So the question comes, are all of these sinus surgeries necessary, or are we chasing mice with shotguns and elephant guns? Are people being over-surgerized for conditions that may be able to treat it, be treated otherwise? And to this audience, these are common symptoms of sinusitis, purulent drainage, congestion, headaches, and facial pain. It's pretty common symptoms that we're talking about. So what are we picturing here? This is the spectrum of treatment for sinusitis. On one side, you have medical therapy, and that includes antibiotics, decongestants, uh, over-the-counter medications such as antihistamine decongestant combinations, oral and topical steroids. And the real limitation on these is what I find is a lot of people use lateral choices. They indiscriminately will throw antibiotics at a viral infection. Or if they choose another antibiotic, it doesn't add a layered approach it's more of a lateral pr approach to the bacterial coverage. And limitations are, obviously, it does not address the underlying anatomy. So if you have anatomical narrowing in the sinuses, you're only s putting a Band-Aid on a future problem. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, sinus surgery. Very well defined with excellent success rates, over 90%. Um, what are the limitations? Requires general anesthesia, longer recovery, and more invasive. So there is a vacuum in the center, potentially, where balloon dilation, taking a balloon catheter, entering it in a narrowed sinus cavity, and opening it with a balloon could provide relief to patients who suffer with mild and moderate sinusitis. Okay? The limitation, it may not be able to treat more complex disease. So people with pan-sinusitis or nasal polyposis 
or um, mucosal problems such as cystic fibrosis, obviously a balloon by itself may not be able to account for um, remission among these people. So where is the idea of balloon sinuplasty? Where does it come from? Obviously it was taken from the field of interventional cardiology, the idea that you can balloon dilate open a plaque. Well, a lot of ENTs really questioned whether it was strong enough or effective enough to open up bony anatomy that was constricted. It was cleared by the FDA in 2005, and as I said, a concern was, were these just companies that were trying to sell a Me Too product that would essentially be the same as doing sinus surgery? Or did it provide a real significant um, therapeutic advantage for a subset of sinus sufferers? Obviously, some of the purported advantages were that it was less invasive, it had quicker recovery, because this is an outpatient technique, and people go home right there without requiring general anesthesia. But the question still remained as to outcomes. Now, why do I call it disruptive? Clay Christensen, the famous Harvard business economist, coined the term disruptive technology in his article in 1995. And he described it as any technology would displace his current technology, leading to a transformation of that field. And I do believe balloon sinuplasty is transformative. It's transformative in a macro way, and it's transformative in a micro way. The macro way is that there's a common perception that procedures lead to higher health care costs, that the more surgeries you do or the more procedures you do, that the cost will be greater. We're going to show some evidence tonight that you actually de decrease health care utilization by doing balloon sinuplasty. It's also, there's a paradigm shift in thinking in a micro way. The idea among most ENTs is once patients suffer from chronic sinusitis, that mucosa is terminally condemned. You can't save it, it's diseased, you must remove it. And that's been changed a little bit in what we talked about with functional endoscopic sinus surgery in a few minutes. But the field that, a, the idea that a balloon can transform this field, that simply by dil dilating open bone and mucosa, you can get permanent relief of sinusitis is somewhat transformative in the thinking of most ENT physicians. Now as I mentioned, this is not the first time that sinusitis has met disruptive technology. In 1985, David Kennedy from the University of Pennsylvania went to Germany and he brought back a transformative procedure called functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Borrowing endoscopes from the field of orthopedics, it allowed the otolaryngologist to put their eye in the sinuses and, and gross extirpative surgery where you would just rip out tissue and remove mucosa stopped and preservation started to occur. The idea with functional surgery is you want to maintain function. You want to leave as much of the mucosa intact and only remove what is necessary to reventilate the sinus. So it minimized tissue disruption. It's now broadly accepted with over 90% success rates. What's funny within the um, field is it already had moved to tissue sparing. Uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, what we'll call FES proponents, had said the less sinus surgery you do, the better. In fact, if you can make a very small opening and remove minimal tissue, that's the best. Well, there's nothing more minimal than a balloon dilation because no tissue is removed at all. So it's an example, as we'll see with balloon sinuplasty, where the technology has really advanced our understanding of the pathophysiology, that as our eye got closer, the nuances of mucociliary flow, the relation of the anatomy of the middle turbinate to the unsnap process to the ethmoids really became more germane. Limitations of FES, tissue damage. Anytime you do surgery where you take out tissue, there's a likelihood you can get scarring. And that happens in cases, and sometimes we have to undergo revision. It involves general anesthesia, and that may not be appropriate for all patients, especially with cardiac or lung disease. High failure rates do still occur, even though there's broad success, it occurs in asthma patients, patients with nasal polyps, allergies, and even Samter's triad, failure rates of 10 to 15%. And if you ask the otolaryngologist, what's the bane of your existence? It's the person you've operated on two or three times that you just can't solve the problem. And we do have those patients. And there's a number of treatment modalities, such as sinus nebulizers, topical irrigations, and other things that we have to do on an outpatient basis, because surgery does not cure these patients completely. And then certainly, with any procedure, you still have significant complications. They're low, 1% to 3%, but orbital injury and blindness, CSF leak, and intracranial injury still do occur. So why would we think that a balloon, by dilating the sinus, would have any broad effect? Well, number one, there's a very important concept. There's a critical site within sinuses called the osteomieto complex, the OMC. It's a junction between the middle turbinate 
the anterior ethmoid, and this protrusion off the maxillary sinus called the uncinate process. This seems to be a very critical area of mucosal contact. That once you get inflammation here, the mucosa is so closely approximated to one another that you start getting inflammation that feeds off of itself and it gets blocked right here. It's also a site that when you radial label antigens, they tend to be deposited as you breathe right here at this junction. It's also a critical area for the common sinus flow. So the frontal sinus drains through this area. The ethmoids and the maxillary all triangulate to this one area. So if this site gets plugged, as in this case, you can get diffuse disease. Ethmoid, maxillary, and we don't show another cut, but this person had frontal sinus opacification too. And again, this is a normal sinus with black aeration. This is a sinus full of polyps and infection that's due to this critical site that's plugged. So the idea with balloon dilation, if you can get in here and push away this surface lining from one another and reestablish ventilation, that's critical. And that's the one thing that antibiotics don't do. They're great at minimizing bacterial load and, infl and uh, inflammation, but they don't necessarily reestablish ventilation. That's where steroids and decongestants come in. Well, a balloon does it in a more permanent way by causing microfractures in the bone, reestablishing patency, and what you're finding in the studies we'll show you is it's a permanent fix in most patients. So what's the technique? The technique is passing a guide wire under direct visualization into a sinus such as the frontal sinus and balloon insufflating the opening to cause microfractures and opening the frontal sinus. It can be done in the sphenoid and in the maxillary, all under direct visualization. Um, there have been cases where people will blindly pass it and you'll follow a light to illuminate it. But it's always better to have direct visualization, especially when you're de dealing with the frontal sinus. Because what's behind the frontal sinus is the brain. And the catheters are soft, but you don't want to be blindly ramming this at the base of the skull for obvious reasons. You could enter the brain and there have been cases of that. Can you uh, hit the video? This is a schematic that will kind of show you what's going on. So you'll see the catheter is being introduced into the frontal sinus here. Um, the balloon is, uh, will be used to inflate and reduce the edema of the tissue, but also cause microfractures uh, to open up this area. Kind of froze on us. Is it still playing there, Dean? You'll see the balloon's advanced over. It'll be inflated and it'll, it'll cause microfractures so these bones actually get permanently separated. And sinus patency is an is a idea that a few millimeters makes a huge difference. If you can take this from being obstructed in the sphenoid here to being just a few millimeters open, that's the difference between having recurrent infections and not. Okay, you can advance to the next slide. This is maxillary, but we'll just go to the next slide. So um, let's talk about safety. Initially, the FDA was all over safety. You know, is passing a catheter in the sinus is safe? Well, clearly over the last 10 years, multiple studies have con confirmed the safety. It's not only been safe for up to two years in follow-up, it's been safe, as we said, in the most problematic sinuses, which are the frontal sinuses. And also, most recently in the intact study, they looked at kids ages 3 to 11 and found safety profiles among children with sinusitis as well. So what we're talking about here is a safe procedure. So the first adage, do no harm, it meets that criteria. So there's consistent safety data among a variety of studies. Next slide. Oh, I can actually advance it. Um, what about the clinical data? So beyond safety, what about efficacy? Well, in, uh, if you start just summarizing all the data from 2005 till a couple of years ago, the balloon-only data, meaning just balloon dilation, demonstrated significant reduction of symptoms in a SNOT-20 score. Now, this is a great term. The sinonasal outcome test. I mean, whoever did this is just a marketing guru. This is a 20-question quality of life survey that a patient takes, and it's statistically validated. On its own, it's been shown that if people have reductions of SNOT scores of 1.0, that is clinically meaningful. And the scale goes from 0 to 5, 5 being severe, 0 being nothing. So if you have a reduction of one, that's clinically meaningful, and I'll show you why that's important later. 
Another piece of data, a little bit of Sherlock Holmes evidence, hybrid procedures where surgery was uh, combined with the balloon did re reveal significant level of symptom reduction just in those patients alone. It wasn't a controlled study, but just patients did better when balloons were added to surgery to increase the patency of sinuses. Low revision rate, so it met the criteria that within a year after the procedure, you weren't getting restenosis and scarring, so it met another criteria to seem like a good technique. And then fi finally, high patient satisfaction. Remember, these patients are awake. So very anxious, very concerned about what are you doing in my face, near my brain, and my eyes. It was hitting high patient satisfaction. Patients were tolerating it well. It wasn't a painful procedure. You numb them up like you would in a dental office, put topical numbing medicine, and even inject a little bit of Novocaine, but patients were tolerating it very well. So that kind of forms the background for this prospective, randomized, multi-center controlled trial that we were participatory in called the REMODEL study. The acronym is Randomized Evaluation of Maxillary Entrostomy versus osteodilation, which is balloon, efficacy through long-term follow-up. I just like the term remodel. So it compared FES, opening up the maxillary sinus, to balloon dilation. We participated with five other centers, and uh, it was powered enough for a 90% predictive value. It's the only study that's been powered enough to make 90% meaningful conclusions on the results, and we'll talk about that. So in September of last year, an article was published with this in the American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy. You can look this up, and I, I think it's a pretty sweet article because it does really do a nice comparison of both groups, and we're going to go through it in a little more detail here. So what was the inclusion criteria? Adults 18 years and older, limited disease. Again, we're talking about mild to moderate disease, maxillary and anterior ethmoids. We're not talking about all the sinuses being full, and uncomplicated. They didn't have any complications from the sinusitis episodes. It had to meet either the 2000 adult sinusitis guidelines, and these are important to talk about. So who are we talking about? Chronic sinusitis, which are in the past 12 months, over 12 weeks duration of symptoms and evidence of inflammation, or what we call recurrent acute sinusitis, spikes of sinusitis that come and go, but over four episodes per year. Or it could meet the 2011 criteria for what the insurance is qualified as criteria for sinus surgery, the Blue Cross Blue Shield criteria, and it did not really specify whether there was mucosal thickening. So this is not a radiographic study. We're not necessarily looking for thickening. They could have thickening, they may not, but this is a clinical symptom study, okay? Who was excluded? Diffuse disease, frontal, posterior ethmoid, and sphenoids, fungal disease, gross polypoid disease, those that required other surgery that would make them not candidates for balloons, so let's say they needed a septoplasty as well, they couldn't be part of the study. Or nasal surgery within three months prior to enrollment, sep severe septal deviation like we mentioned, and then finally some systemic conditions that would make them not good candidates for either surgery or th for balloon sinuplasty. Because again, diffuse conditions, there's no reason to think a balloon will be any better than anything else they're still going to have problems. For those of you that don't know what Samter's triad is, it's a combination of aspirin sensitivity, asthma, and polyposis, okay? And so it's really an allergic condition where people have a sensitivity towards acetyl salicylic acid. They tend to form asthma and polyps. If you desensitize them to aspirin, you actually get control of the condition. But if they, if they had those, they were not part of this study. So what are the primary study endpoints? Long-term symptom improvement. We did baseline SNOT scores and six-month SNOT scores. I just love saying that word. And then mean number of post-operative debridements. We looked at removal of dead fibrinous tissue, which we normally do after sinus surgery, in the balloon group, which would, would not expect to have much, and the sinus surgery group. Because realize this adds a healthcare burden. Patients have to come back after sinus surgery to have their nose debrided. They have to have crusts removed. It's uncomfortable. And unfortunately, it leads to higher billing. I mean, there's costs associated this, with this on healthcare costs. So we wanted to compare the number with balloon group to sinus surgery group. Secondary study endpoints, we wanted to see how they did right after the procedure with nausea, nasal bleeding, duration of analgesic use, and recovery time. Short-term symptom improvement. We measured SNOT scores at one week and one month. We combined them and we compared both groups. Complication rate and revision rate. So let's look at the population. To summarize this slide, there was no significant differences among either the balloon group or FES group in terms of the population. Relative similar age groups, gender groups, ethnicity, 
allergies did not differ between the groups, nor did asthma symptoms. You know, not statistically significant differences here. Uh, previous nasal surgery were uh, not statistically significant. This score, lund mckay score, is a measure of the CT scan severity. What you do is you rate each side of the CT scan with a, with a rating of 0 to 12. So this is per side. This rating of 3.2 and 3.6 means relatively mild to moderate disease. If you have a score of 12, that's severe disease on the lund mckay score for the CT scan. So I want to tell you this is mild to moderate disease. These are not severe sinusitis on CT scan. And they didn't differ with chronic rhinusitis, sinusitis diagnoses or the number of sinus infections per year. Th these, are, these are patients that are having between four to five sinus infections per year, and you'll want to remember that number. Or their duration. These patients, on average, had ranges of 12 years, no statistical significant difference. So there are 50 patients in the balloon group, 42 in the functional endoscopic sur surgery group. This is a bias here. Eight patients did not want to go. When they were randomized, eight patients didn't want to go under sinus surgery. They said, I want the balloon technique, the new one. And so they said, if I'm not going to do the new technique, then I don't want to do it. And so there is a bias here that there may be a, a subset of these patients that maybe had more severe disease that could have ended up in, in one or two groups. But these guys did not get any procedure at all. But what's amazing is 91 of 92 patients completed the six-month follow-up. So let's look at the results. So it's not 20 score. Remember, 5 is severe. Average scores for the balloon group in blue was uh, about 2.5. They had a marked reduction in the, sign, in the SNOT score. Remember I said a, uh, a drop of greater than 1 is meaningful. These guys dropped 60, 66% in their sinonasal survey score. But so did the FEST group. They dropped as well. There was no statistical significant difference between the groups, but both of these independently were significant. So the conclusion is balloon dilation was at least as efficacious as FES was. We weren't losing anything by doing a balloon versus sinus surgery for these patients. Now we talked about debridements. Look at the drastic difference. Obviously the balloon group, because you're not removing tissue, has a huge difference in the number of debridements. And that's obviously dilation then results in less postoperative debridements than FES, and by a marked degree. What about outcomes on the secondary scale? Nausea, there was really no significant difference, although there was a trend that the balloon group did better, obviously because they didn't under, undergo general anesthesia. But there was a significant difference in those with nasal bleeding. Again, because the balloon group, you're just dilating tissue. There will be some bleeding, but not as much as you would with the FES group that you're actually formally removing tissue. So the conclusion is post-op nasal bleeding was less for the dilation group than it was for the sinus surgery group. Secondary outcomes, recovery time, statistically significant difference. Now realize, this is a big number. 4.8 days on average for someone after sinus surgery to get better, 1.6 after balloon. That means patients can go to work a lot quicker, resume normal activity a lot quicker. That's a big difference. It also achieves statistical significance for the duration of prescribed pain meds. Obviously, if you're just doing a balloon dilation, it makes sense. You're doing less tissue disruption. It shouldn't be as painful. But there was no difference here in over-the-counter pain medicine. So people may have been using Tylenol instead of prescription. Okay. When we averaged the one week and one month SNOT scores, there was a significant difference by the reduction of the SNOT scores from the balloon group to the FES group. So short-term improvement was better for the balloon group. Why did we combine them? Well, if you just do a SNOT survey after one week, there may be a tendency, because people had surgery, to perceive that they had a worse thing from the general anesthesia. Maybe they had dry mouth afterwards. We wanted to kind of minimize the effect of the anesthesia and give more of a, a broader view at one month what it would look like. But it looks like at least patients from a SNOT 20 score are doing better on, on the balloon dilation. So there are no complications in either group. And what's interesting is the one patient who had revision on the balloon was my patient. And I can tell you a little bit about it. It was probably an inappropriate selection on my part. It's someone who had had a dental infection. When I looked in their sinuses, had gross granulation tissue. And I thought, look, maybe the balloon could work on this patient. And they failed the balloon, had to be brought to surgery, and they, were, they recovered after the surgery. But that one patient that failed was mine. And then there was one patient that failed in the sinus surgery group. I'll say that one wasn't mine. So subgroup analysis. Was there any difference among subgroups? When you break it down even further, n none of these subgroups made any difference to the SNOT score. 
whether the maxillary only was affected versus the maxillary and ethmoid, whether there was an accessory ostium, was it an accessory opening in the sinus cavity or not. Septal deviation had no effect. And this is important, whether they had chronic sinusitis or recurrent acute sinusitis, no differences between the groups. So really, both groups did well and equivalently well. Now, we've published, this just got accepted recently, a one-year follow-up. So that data you saw was at six months. This is a one-year follow-up. And I'm just going to summarize it quickly. This is important information. Remember how I said that there was, on average, between four to five infections per year? At one year, there was an average decrease of 4.2 infections per year in the balloon group and 3.5 in the FEST group. I mean, that takes them down from five infections a year to one infection a year. That is a significant number. The p-value was, was huge. And that's a real reduction in healthcare utilization. If you reduce the number of times you have to see your physician by four or five times a year, plus antibiotics, plus time off work, you're talking about real numbers. And there was also what we call the work productivity scale. Both groups showed improvements in daily activity and overall work productivity at one year. Revision surgery stayed low. And the patency, remember the disruptive idea that you could balloon dilate an opening and have it stay open? 96.7% of those balloon cases stayed open at one year. 98.7 obviously in the FEST group because you did surgery and you removed bone. But in the balloon group, I think this is transformative. The idea that you get long-term patency is a, is a paradigm shift in thinking. So what are our conclusions? Standalone balloon dilation and FEST are obviously both safe and effective. The debridement was lower uh, with the balloon group versus the FEST group. Balloon dilation recovery outcomes were better on these following things. Frequency of nasal bleeding, duration of of prescribed pain medication, time to return to normal that activities, remember 4.8 days versus 1.6, and short and lo long-term symptom improvement. Couple of quick summary slides on other data. Our revision rates of 2%, this is our study here, compare very favorably with other studies with standalone balloon technique. In fact, it's, it's one of the better numbers, and uh, my, my one failure, it would have been zero, but I had the one failure right here, so I caused this little blip here. Um, but when you compare it to traditional FES, FES non-frontal versus frontal FES, you can see frontal tends to have high, higher rates of failure because the drainage tract of the frontal sinus is much more like a spiral staircase and not a direct shot like a maxillary is. At least on revision rates, standalone balloon, standalone balloon dilation compares very favorably even to hybrid techniques. So I think that we're okay on the numbers of revisions. We're not having people fail. And this is a big concern among insurance companies. They say, well, if we approve this balloon technique, which only about 50% of insurance companies do, are we going to be dealing with having to go to sinus surgery a year later when you fail? The answer is no. It stays open, and there's very low revision, lower than we'd expect from sinuses, sinus surgery. This is a very important slide. There's another study called the Breathe 1 and Breathe 2 study. Again, great symptom improvement among uh, balloon dilation through two years, measuring the SNOT-20 score. 92% of patients were satisfied. But this is transformative, is that you could bi balloon dilate the maxillary, but people with both maxillary and ethmoid disease improved. Now, that's transformative. Normally, the thinking in sinus surgery is if a sinus is involved, you've got to go and open it. If the ethmoids are involved, you've got to open them. This is saying if you balloon dilate it just by pushing away the mucosa, you get resolution of the ethmoid disease. So less surgery, less procedures seems to be beneficial for these patients. And you'll see maxillary only versus maxillary and ethmoid equivalent improvements. And they both dropped on the snot thing to a, below a clinical, clinically meaningful number from 2.7 way down to below 1. And then the last thing, transformative, we talked about healthcare utilization. Look at this study, the relief study. A different survey, not the SNOT-20, rhinosinusitis symptom inventory. They showed a significant reduction in the number of MD and nurse visits due to nasal problems for both CRS and recurrent sinusitis, and a reduction in antibiotic use. So here are the two groups with balloon dilation, one interval before the procedure between six to eight infections, uh, in six to eight visits a year, down to two to three afterwards. Average number of antibiotic courses, five to above six, down to two to three. So this is where the thinking needs to change, that not all procedures are bad. Some reduce healthcare utilization in a significant way, and it lasts for up to two years. So finally, proven safety in the OR and office setting. This can be done safely in the office. We've done it repeatedly. 
very tolerated by patients, high rate of technical success. Um, I think the more and more that otolaryngologists do the procedure, the more comfortable they do with numbing the patient and comforting the patient. Uh, some of them, uh, Dr. Anderson has been out to some clinics where they'll actually give them some sedation. Um, I find most patients do pretty well. The, the biggest concern is they start hearing bone crackling in their head. It's not even pain. It's they hear these weird sounds, and it startles them because it's louder to them than it is to us, and you have to reassure them what's going on. But again, low rates of revision and high rates of satisfaction. But I think this is really the, the big disruptive technology, po decrease in post-operative health care utilization. And I think if you can do a lower cost technique, which minimizes general anesthesia, minimizes in insurance billing, because it's obviously less to not have to bill for general anesthesia, and reduce the amount of time people miss work and use antibiotics, that's significant. So who do you consider it for? Again, spikes of sinusitis that are resolving between um, episodes. So even though the CT scan may look normal, if they qualify on the SNOT 20 or they qualify on the number of antibiotics they've been using or on symptom severity, they could be candidates. So CT alone is not a good measure. And then finally, chronic sinusitis, continual symptoms of over 12 weeks in a 12-month period. So it could be people that have three weeks of symptoms and then resolve and have another four weeks later on and resolve or have maybe chronic symptoms during allergy season that go on forever and their sinusitis episodes go during that time. And it's refractory to medical treatment. So comparison balloon, comparison to FAST equivalent. After one week, it seems balloon does better. Redu reduction need in prescription medications. We talked about the return to activity and certainly a lot less depredments. And then just, um, we tried to run this video earlier, but essentially this is uh, Dr. Gould, who's at, out of Missouri, passing it up in the frontal sinus and balloon dilating open the sinus. I'm sorry, the video can't work. Um, but essentially, it showed, you can actually see it, uh, it's kind of hard with these overhead lights, but you can see the transillumination here in the frontal area. That once you pass this probe with a light on it, you can see it enter the frontal sinus. It's kind of lighter right here. And then they balloon dilate it. And especially patients like pilots who have barosinus syndrome where they'll go up and down in altitude and get sinus squeeze and tremendous headaches. This seems to be effective in that as well. That is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you guys for the attention. Yes. How many what, Ralph? Yeah, it's, it's a pressurized syringe. It's probably about two to three cc's and it's under pressure. Uh, pressurized syringe so it can't explode out the sides, but it, it balloon dilates it in very strong, high, high turgor, high pressure. But it's about two to three cc's in the balloon, in the syringe. Yes? Frontal size tends to be a different, different ball of wax. This was meant to be mild to moderate disease, which is mostly what we see. Um, there are studies, on, as I pointed out before, on just the frontals, and they get, they get great results, but not quite as good as the maxillary results. Because again, that spiral staircase is hard to find in the frontals. So in our study, it was limited to maxillary and anterior ethmoid because that's the common patient we see. But there are other studies with balloons and frontals that corroborate equivalent results to sinus surgery. Probably less complication rates and, and a quicker recovery as well in those studies. Good question though. Once you involve the frontals, as you saw from the revision rates, you're really involving another sinus that's more difficult. So you don't want to have that bias results on one study or the other. So it's kind of separated out. Yes? Uh, both are great questions. Well, realize in this town we're limited by insurance coverage. So o over 50% of the insurances don't cover it. None of the select plans cover it. Blue Cross is still vetting it. There are insurance plans. Medicare, interestingly enough, covers it. Medicare got it right on this one. And so I've talked to the private payers on the utilization. They're worried that if you open this up to doctors, that there's going to be a whole run of patients having it done, maybe patients that wouldn't be appropriate to have it done. But my comment is, well, they reserve the right to review anything anyway, and they can deny anything, that, and they usually do it anyway. So my comment is no different than someone's taking the sinus surgery. They have a right to review the criteria and make sure there really are medical failures here. So how many ENTs are doing it? I probably would say a handful of ENTs. Uh, I know a lot of them have done it in the operating room. So most ENTs have tried it in the operating room. Probably a few are doing it in the office at this point.
but a growing number. And I'm sorry, your second question? Yeah, I'll tell you there's going to be a transition where more and more tests are going to be done with the balloon. But I would say this way, if it's limited maxillary disease, limited ethmoid disease, they're, they're a consideration for the balloon technique, as long as the patient's willing to undergo it. Anything more severe, posterior ethmoid, frontal, other things that are more involved, you can still do the balloon, but you probably are, are, are talking about a longer time involved. And some, some doctors don't feel comfortable keeping, keeping the patient in the office doing a long hour-long procedure that way. But there's a growing trend. Dr. Anderson could speak to it. He went out to Colorado Springs. They're doing more advanced procedures, almost sinus surgery in the office setting. And patients are really tolerating it very, very well. Maybe, Doug, you wanted to comment about your visit up to Colorado Springs and kind of what you've seen. No, thank you so much. And there was a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's hard to, but you can see osteopatency. No, you can't see the fracture lines because it's micro fractures in the bone. But you can see that the osteum is patent still. And that was reviewed in our study. We had an independent otolaryngologist, separate of anybody doing the procedures, review the osteopatency numbers that we had. And that's where that came from, is it's not reoccluded. Realize when a CT scan is done, most of those scans are three millimeter cuts. Now, if you think about it, three millimeter cuts is essentially the width of what you're opening here. So it's very common to miss that opening when you're doing a CT. You almost have to do very fine cuts to pick that up. Um, we tried to visualize it. The problem is the unsinate process, the best way to describe it, it's kind of like a bug guard on the front of your truck. It's a flange that sticks out that almost forms a guard on the maxillary opening. So the maxillary opening is not directly visualizable in most people. So to go around that unsinate process, look around the bug guard at the opening is just difficult to do technically. Patients don't tolerate it real well. But you cannot see the fracture line on the CT scan. Yes? Your point is very well taken. The answer is always very carefully because a deviated septum, it depends what degree you're talking about. If it's severe, you may not be able to do this procedure. But this is what Dr. Anderson was alluding to. Dr. Knox would numb up that deviated septum right there, take down that spur that's deviated right there in the office, and then you can do the procedure. So again, this thought that you have to have everyone asleep to do nasal surgery is really being redefined now. And so I'm actually going out next week to see the full scope of what's being done. But you're right, if that deviated septum is enough, it's enough to cause a domino effect where you can't get into that sinus. So you have to address the deviated septum. And that may be a case where you choose FES with a septoplasty because it's more involved. There's another question back here. Yes? It does both. So it does so both. Well, by definition, when you move a bone, it's got to fracture. It's got to move out of position to hold its position again, right, by definition. Uh, because the balloon is under such strong pressure, there are, there are micro fractures, and, and you're actually hear, you can actually hear it when you do it with the patient. You can hear those fractures occurring. But you're talking about micro fractures in the, in the area where the bone is attached. So it does both. It compresses the mucosa, but that's going to be more transient, right? Because the mucosal inflammation will come and go. What's more important is that the bony anatomy changes slightly enough to maintain patency. What's the longest follow-up you've got? I know where I bumped my knee and I injured. Now I've got this bump here. What am I going to do with the doctor says no? Yeah. So the longest that we have in our study, we have about half of those 90, we had 92 patients. We have about half of them, 48, are up to 18 months. 
Same reduction in symptoms, same patency. Now, the farthest they've done in studies is up to two years. And they say after two years, things are fairly equivalent because, you know, if you follow someone five years from now, that's not going to give you any more useful information than two years. But it's a good question. You do both. You open the mucosa, but you also have to change the bony anatomy. Just to compress the mucosa, that over time will, in, will inflame with allergies and other conditions. That would, that would be a temporary fix. Oh, 100%. So you're taking one Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, do you have to give like preoperative antibiotics to calm the condition down? You know, you actually don't have to, but most people would just because you're going to get less bleeding. The procedure will become easier to see, right? If they have pus draining out, it's just harder to see. But do you have to do it? The answer is no. I've done patient with acute infected sinus. And you get, you're able to actually suction through the new opening. You can feel the enlarged patency. You can now introduce the suction and clean out some of that infection. See, this is the real debate. It's even a debate in our field because people say, what do you do with these patients? Because what, what's the alternative? The alternative is more medical therapy. And clearly, they're not responding to that. So the answer is yes. The data here would say that in a recurrent acute case, you may not be catching the inflammation on a CT. But if these are defined episodes of sinusitis, you have to be sure about that, that these are not just URIs that are being mistreated. If you're sure that these are sinusitis episodes, balloon dilating it would be the answer. But you have to be sure about that. And that's tough, because a lot of people get mistreated with antibiotics that are colds. So you can't really count those. You've got to say, you know, go through the symptoms. How long did it last for? Did it get better? You know, and because a cold will get better oftentimes on its own too. You know, if you do a CT scan on people with upper respiratory infections, 100% have CT findings. Obviously, because they have mucus and they have retention, but not all those people need surgery. And in the ENT community, there's a disconnect between the CT severity and the SNOT 20 severity. There's a disconnect. Not all CT matches up with the, with the sinusitis survey. So you can't always wait till the CT findings are there. Yes? Yeah, so it, uh, again, speaking apples to apples, if you're going to talk about sinus surgery, you've got to cover the anesthesia cost, the facility fee, and the surgeon's fee. On average, you're talking between thirteen to 15000 for sinus surgery for all of that. The surgeon fee is probably maybe 20% of that, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending on what's done. For the balloon technique, it ranges from about 3,300 to about 5,000, depending on what you're doing sinus-wise. If you do only one sinus, it's more like 2,500 to 3,000. If you're doing more than one sinus, meaning you do maxillary and frontal, now you're talking more like five or 6,000. So in all cases, it's a lot less to do it in the office. No general anesthesia, no facility fee. The balloon uh, is a fair amount of it. The balloon costs about sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars. <laughs> For you, it is. No one else. <laughs> no, there actually are people that are trying to form reusable things. I've seen a study recently talking about Foley catheters. You know, they say, "Look, are, are we going to have to pay these companies?" And that was a lot of concern among the ENT community was, are these just companies trying to make money on selling catheters? And so that was a lot of the early resistance. But you got to look through that to the real data and say, are patients being helped? Are these significant improvements? And my view is always do it the cheapest way possible. If there was a balloon catheter company that could do a, a reusable or something that could be sterilizable that was defined, I wouldn't want to use it. But uh, but if there's, if there's a way to do it to save money, we would pass that on. That would be important. Yes? They're the same balloons, but they're different configurations. The length is different, right? Because you're talking about larger lengths here. You're talking about macro dilations. But the same idea with the balloons. They're not the same balloons, though. Um, five to ten seconds, but we do it repeatedly. 
because these sinus tracts are sometimes long, so you'll do it initially to get an opening. You'll pass it through, do it again. I usually dilate each sinus about three times between five to 10 seconds. And then you can actually tell, you go, wow, the catheter really goes in a lot easier. You can feel the difference after you're done. It's not you just balloon dilate and leave. You want to make sure it's open because you want this to be a permanent change. Yes? Yeah, I can. Yeah, um, I've not had one, and it's unusual because the balloon competency should be there, but it, like anything, if it catches the bony edge, it could become uh, compromised. Was that the question, whether it gets compromised? Yeah, I've never had one happen. Because you're talking about two or three inflations, it's usually competent for those. You go here and then here. Yeah, so this is a great question for sinusitis. So I love the world of irrigations because I think it offers a new pathway to try to clear out sinuses. Uh, I'm a big proponent of using uh, saline. There's a lot of studies that saline alone does a great job. Um, we also can add medications to sinus irrigations. For example, if people are colonized with MRSA, uh, Dr. Anderson uh, and, and I will often use things like Bactroban, Mupiracin in the irrigation to decolonize them. You can also use things topically that you couldn't do orally or IV. You can use things like tobramycin, which is a you know a caustic antibiotic that can cause a number of problems when used IV. You've got to follow levels of immunoglycoside therapy. My wife is an infectious disease pharmacist. She always talks about you know the deleterious effects of antibiotics. Of course, this isn't a great topic to talk about here, but 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 you can use stuff topically that you otherwise wouldn't be able to use IV. So we often will add things to the irrigation that make a big difference for, let's say, gram-negative bacteria. The other thing that I tend to do is I found that Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo, this is a really low-cost technique. You can use one drop in about eight ounces of salt water, and it breaks up that real tenacious, viscous crust that occurs. It's non-irritating. A drop in eight ounces is nothing, but that surfactant that, that exists in the J&J &J baby shampoo can really break down a lot of dryness and crusting, especially in people in Utah where, where there's just no ambient moisture. So I'm a big proponent of sinus irrigations, especially after they failed sinus surgery. Um, there was another. Yes, sir. I hate to bring up a complex question, but I can't resist. This sounds so interesting. Have you had any experience using this for treating nosebleeds when people have HHT? Yeah, so HHT is a, is a disorder of the capillary formation. Usually it's treated usually by laser therapy to try to get rid of some of these capillaries that are prominent on the septum. The answer is no. Um, because it sounds like it might be useful. Some yeah. of these people have had so many different procedures they end up closing the nose altogether yeah. in order and, to get dry. Yeah, and that's true. So what happens is HHT is a chronic nosebleed condition where actually some people will lay a flat, take off the whole mucosa that's lined with blood and put a skin flap on there, yeah. and then it ends up scarring and, and crusting, but no, it hasn't been used for that. It, this is mostly for sinus patency. It yeah, it could be an application. Okay, thank you guys for your attention. You. No, you're great. <laughs> you're great. We would like to thank Dr. Picazzi for that excellent presentation on balloon sinuplasty. Uh, you could tell by the number of questions it was very interesting and, and uh, something that we'll all look forward to seeing how, how it all plays out in the future. But I think it definitely has some exciting uh, applications for us, especially as we're trying to cut health care costs and, uh, and uh, decrease postoperative pain and, and uh, morbidity. So anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it from him in the future. Um, so we'd like to thank him for that excellent presentation. This time, I, I told you this.